Hi everyone, it's Miss Wyman and I'm going to read for you the very end of The Nutcracker. Um, this is the Maurice Sendak version of the original story, The Nutcracker. And finally, we get to, fight, to, to learn how it all ends. And this chapter is called The Capital. Nutcracker clapped his little hands. The wind came roaring over the lake and the waves rose higher. A gondola made entirely of glittering jewels appeared in the distance and quickly came closer. It was drawn by two, two dolphins with golden scales. Twelve dear little moors with caps and little aprons woven of gleaming hummingbird feathers leaped ashore and carried first Marie, then Nutcracker to the gondola which quickly started off again. Now, what's a gondola? Well, there's quite a few hints in this paragraph that point to it. First of all, they're on a lake and the gondola is made of glittering jewels. Um, dolphins are um, drawing it close to them. It's basically a long, shallow boat that people would stand on and use poles to push along. You'd see this in Venice and other cities that have streets of, of streams or water. Oh, how lovely it was for Marie to glide over the waters in the gondola. With the scent of roses all about her and the rosy wa waves below, the two golden dolphins raised their nostrils and spouted crystal streams high into the air. And as the spray fell in filmy rainbows, two silvery voices sang, Who is this on the rosy water, a fairy or a fairy's daughter? Bim, bim, little fishes, sim, sim, golden swans. Fairies, come hither, fly through the spray. Splish, splash, splish, splash, the rosy spray. But the twelve little moors had a who had jumped up on the back of the gondola seemed to take offense at the singing streams of water for this for they shook their uh, parasols so violently that the palm leaves they were made of and here you see the the illustrator's um imagination of the gondola but i picture a shallow boat um that's really long and people stand on moving you can see this guy has a stick in his hand that's typical for gondolas so made of rattled and at the same time they stamped their feet in a strange rhythm and sang clip clop clip clop down and up back moors feet must never stop swans and fishes wiggle and glide gondola must smoothly ride clip clop clip clop those moors are all very well he said but if they keep that up, they're going to make the whole lake rebellious. And true enough, a deafening hubbub broke out. A medley of strange voices that seemed to be partly in the air and partly in the water. But Marie paid no attention to them, for she was looking into the fragrant rosy waves, from each of which a charming little girl's face smiled at her. Oh, she cried, clapping her little hands. Look, Mr. Drosselmeyer, Princess Pearlipat is down there. She's smiling at me as sweetly as can be. Oh, dear Dr Mr. Drosselmeyer, do look and see. Uh, this little trick of literature has happened in many, many stories. I'm thinking of the Chronicles of Narnia series, uh, looking over a boat and seeing reflections in the water and those reflections turning into something else. But listen to what happens. But Nutcracker sighed almost sorrowfully and said, Dear Mistress Stallbaum, that's not Prince Perlipat, that's you. Your own self. It's your own sweet face smiling at you out of the waves. At that, Marie raised her head, closed her eyes tight, and felt ashamed. And just then, the twelve little moors lifted her out of the carriage and carried her ashore. She found herself in a small thicket that was almost more beautiful than the Christmas wood. Everything in it sparkled. But most wonderful of all were the strange, wondrously colored fruits, which gave off a delicious fragrance. 
This Sid Nutcracker is Marmalade Grove. And over there, you see the Capitol. Here are some illustrations for us. Looks like a storm brewing and a shipwreck. And look at this guy. He has been imported from where the wild, wild things live. And this would be the capital or the entrance to the capital. All of these illustrations are in that book. Okay, now uh, with these characters and this text about the capital, I'm reminded of the ballet, and this is where lots of ideas for the ballet came from. And what did Marie see? How shall I even begin to describe the beauty and splendor of the city that now lay before her on the broad, flowery plain? Not only were the walls and towers of the most magnificent colors, but the shapes of the buildings were like nothing else on earth. For instead of roofs and houses wore Oh, the houses wore delicately plated crowns, and the towers were wreathed in very colored foliage. As the two of them emerged from the city gateway, which looked as if it had been made of mac macaroons and candied fruits, silver soldiers presented arms, and a little man in a brocade dressing gown threw his arms around Nutcracker and said, Welcome, noble prince. Welcome to Candy Town. Marie was not a little surprised that so very distinguished a person should recognize Drosselmeyer as a prince. But then she heard so many fine little voices clamoring all at once, such rejoicing and laughter, such singing and playing, that she forgot everything else, and she had to ask Nutcracker what it all meant. Oh, most honored Mistress Stallbaum, Nutcracker replied, there's nothing unusual about it. Candy Town is a big bustling city. It's like this every day. Let's go. Let's just go on a little farther. They had taken only a few steps when they came to a large marketplace that was most amazing to behold. The houses around it were all made of sugar filigree. There were whole tiers of arcades, and in the middle stood an obelisk of cake with white icing around, which four beautifully carved fountains spouted orangeade, lemonade, and other tasty sweet drinks. And the basin was full of custard that you might have eaten with a spoon. But prettiest of all were the de delightful little people, thousands of whom came thronging together from all sides, laughing and singing and joking. In short, the merry hubbub that Marie had heard in the distance. There were beautifully dressed ladies and gentlemen. There were Armenians and Greeks, Jews and Thai. Tyrolians, officers and common soldiers, clergymen, preachers, and shepherds and clowns, as many different kinds of people as there are in the world. On one corner, the tumult was wilder than elsewhere. People were scattering in a panic because the Grand Mogul was being carried past a litter in a litter escorted by 93 grandees of the empire and 700 slaves. But it is but it so happened that on the next corner, 500 members of the Fisherman's Guild were putting on their annual parade. Uh-oh. And unfortunately, the Sultan of Turkey had taken it into his head to come riding across the marketplace at that very moment with 3,000 Janissaries to make matters worse. The grand procession of the interrupted sacrifice came along at the same time. The band played and the adepts marched toward the obelisk, intoning their hymn, Arise, give thanks to the sun. The result was a pushing and shoving and squeaking. Soon there were cries of lamentation, for in the crush a fisherman had knocked a, Brahm a Brahmin's head off and the grand mogul was almost run down by a clown. People were beginning to punch and pound one another when the men in the brocade dressing gown who had hailed Nutcracker as a prince climbed up on, a obel on the obelisk. An extraordinarily loud bell was rung three times and he cried aloud, pastry cook, pastry cook, pastry cook. 
Instantly, the hubbub died down. The processions disentangled themselves as best they could. The soiled mogul was brushed off and the Brahmin's head was pasted back on. What does this make you think of? I think of the toys versus the rats and how heads were chewed off of the gingerbread men. Do you think that these people in this capital are real, are real living human, like flesh humans? No, they're not, right? The capital is made out of candy and, and treats. So this is all very imaginary, right? Dear Mr. Dr Mr. Drosselmeyer, Marie asked, what's all this about? A pastry cook? Oh, uh, okay, right. Uh, Mistress Stahlbaum, Nutcracker replied, here the name of pastry cook is given to an unknown but cruel spirit, which is thought to have total power over the people. It is the destiny that governs this merry little nation, and the people stand so much in awe of it that, as the Lord Mayor has sh just shown, the wildest disorders can be quelled by the mere mention of, his na of the name. When that happens, no one thinks of earthly matters such as pokes in the ribs or clouts over the head. Everyone looks within and says to himself, what is man and what can be done with him? Marie could not repress a cry of surprise and admiration when she saw before her a castle with a hundred lofty towers bathed in a rose in a rosette glow. Now and then splendid bouquets of violets, daffodils, tulips, and gilly flowers were strewn over its walls, accentuating the pinkish whiteness of the background with their glowing dark colors. The gigantic dome of the central building and the pyram pyramidal roofs of the towers were sprinkled with thousands of gold and silver stars. This, said Nutcracker, is Marzipan Castle. Marzipan is a type of, uh, it's like a frosting that goes over cakes. Marie lost herself in contemplation of the magic castle, but it didn't escape her that one of the main towers had no roof and that some little men perched on a scaffolding of cinnamon sticks were evidently trying to put one on. But before she had time to question Nutcracker, he explained. Not so long ago, this castle was threatened with destruction. The giant sweet tooth came along, gobbled up the roof of that tower and was nibbling at the, the big dome. The citizens of Candytown bought him off by offering him a whole precinct of the city and a considerable part. Here's the giant sweet tooth. And look, don't they look like marshmallows, maybe? This looks like the marzipan. It's like a type of frosting, like ribbons of frosting. So he was bought off by giving him um, the whole precinct of the city of the city and a considerable part of Marmalade Grove. The giant accepted the offer, gorged himself, and went on his way. At that moment, soft music was heard. The gates of the castle opened and out stepped 12 pages holding lighted clove sticks as torches. Their heads were pearls, their bodies rubies and emeralds, and they tripped along on beautifully worked little feet of pure gold. After them came four ladies almost as big as Marie's Clara, but so richly and splendidly attired that Marie knew they could only be princesses. After embracing Nutcracker tenderly, they cried out, Oh, my prince, my beloved prince, oh, my brother. Nutcracker seemed deeply moved. He wiped floods of tears from his eyes, took hold of Marie's hand, and said with great feeling, This is Mistress Marie Stahlbaum, the daughter of an eminent physician. She saved my life. If she hadn't thrown her slipper at the right time, if she hadn't outfitted me with the pensioned colonel's sword, I'd be lying in my grave, bitten to pieces by the abominable king of the mice. Tell me now, can Perlipat, though a true princess, hold a candle to Mistress Stahlbaum for beauty, kindness, and virtue? No, I say not. All the ladies exclaimed, no, and fell on Marie's neck, gasping 
through their sobs. Fell on her neck means they hugged her around the neck. O oh, noble savior of our beloved princely brother, excellent Mr. Stahlbaum. The ladies led Marie and Nutcracker to an in, inner room whose walls were made of sparkling colored crystal. But what Marie liked best about the place were the dear little chairs, tables, bur bureaus, writing desks, and so on, all made of cedar or Brazil wood strewn with golden flowers. The princesses bade Marie and Nutcracker be seated and announced their intention of preparing a meal with their own hands. First, they set out lots of little dishes and bowls of the finest Japanese porcelain and the plenty of spoons, knives, forks, graters, casseroles, and other kitchenware of all, all of gold and silver. Then they bought then they brought in the most wonderful fruit and candy Marie had ever seen and began with their little snow white hands to squeeze the fruit, crush the spices, and grate the sugared almonds. In short, they did all they could to show Marie what first rate cooks they were and what a splendid meal she could look forward to. Knowing that she too was well versed in such matters, she secretly wished that she could be allowed to give the princesses a hand. As though reading Marie's mind, the most beautiful of Nutcracker's sisters handed her a little golden mortar saying, Dear sweet friend, you who saved her brother's life, would you care to pound some of this rock candy? While Marie pounded the rock candy so cheerfully that the mortar murmured a kind of song, Nutcracker related slowly and at great length the, histo the history of the cruel war between the Mouse King's army and his own how the cowardice of his troops had brought about his defeat, how the hideous king of the mice had been on the point of biting him to pieces, and Marie had been obliged to sacrifice a good many of his subjects who were in her service, etc. Remember when she had to give up her, her toys and her, her gifts to the mouse king in order to keep Nutcracker alive? That was her sacrifice. As Marie listened to his story, it seemed to her that his words and even the strokes of her pestle sounded more and more faint and distant. Soon she saw silvery mists, which seemed to rise up and engulf the princesses, the pages, Nutcracker and herself. She heard a strange singing and whirring and buzzing, which ebbed away in the distance. Higher and higher she rose, as though on mounting waves, higher and higher and higher. What's happening here? I'll just tell you. She's waking up. 